Well, <clears throat> tonight we are going to be uh, looking at uh, where we left off last time, and that is at the early ministry of Christ. We are on page uh, 12 in your notes. And when we talk about the early ministry of Christ, uh, we notice that, um, as you can see on the chart, that the only gospel that addresses this first year of Christ's life is the Gospel of John. Uh, this is uh, amazing to us. I, uh, I don't think any of us really understand why it turned out that way, but the reality is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke go right from the temptation of Christ into the Galilean ministry. And so um, it probably would be a good idea if you would uh, uh, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, because we're going to be in John for just a little bit this evening. Now we're going to look at uh, five things that um, um, are a part of this first year of Jesus' ministry. It seems that what the Lord was doing was going throughout all the land and basically saying, here I am. I'm here. And so Judea and Galilee and even into Samaria. And so the, um, we have a, a number of first things that happen here. And uh, the first thing I would uh, turn your attention to is in John chapter 1 and in verse 35 where you have uh, Jesus beginning to get his first disciples. Now keep in mind that um, these are not apostles. Uh, these are disciples. They are learners. They are followers. Most of Jesus' early disciples apparently were disciples of John the Baptist. And then John, as he pointed to Jesus, um, many of his disciples left and began to follow Jesus. And as John would comment later on, he must increase, I must decrease. My job is to uh, announce him and my followers become his followers. Chapter 1 of John and verse 35, again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked upon Jesus as he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus, and Jesus turned and beheld them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? We'd like to come and hang out a bit. He said to them, come and you will see. They came therefore and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. It was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John, John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The other one most likely is, the apostle, is John, the author. John um, never mentions himself in his gospel anywhere. And so the very fact that you're naming names here and then leaving out a key character, uh, most uh, Bible students say, hey, he's talking about himself at this point. So probably Andrew and John. Verse 41, he, Andrew, first found his own brother Simon, Simon Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. So the next day, uh, he finds Philip and then Nathaniel. So here we have at the very beginning, um, five disciples of John the Baptist by name, who, as it turns out, are going to end up amongst the twelve. But um, at this point, that's not a given, at least not yet. So <clears throat> Jesus begins to bring together um, disciples of John the Baptist. He then heads back up north from the Jordan River Valley, goes back up into Galilee, and he arrives at Cana. And this, of course, is the place where he does the famous miracle of turning water into wine. So, <clears throat> um, chapter 2 at Cana of Galilee, um, in verse 11, it says, This beginning of signs did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. So, <clears throat> this is in fact 
the first uh, miracle that Jesus worked. Um, you have some apocryphal literature uh, that has Jesus as a boy doing miracles and that kind of thing, and that uh, is that never happened. <laughs> that is definitely fake news. This is the first miracle that he did, but we need to ask ourselves a question about miracles. Uh, first of all, what is a miracle? Uh, not every work of God is a miracle. Uh, and uh, how many did Jesus work anyway? Well, we'll answer that one. Um, we don't know. There are, I think, 35 specific ones that are mentioned, but when you see the summary passages, it is safe to say that Jesus did thousands of miracles and perhaps even tens of thousands. My guess is that after his earthly ministry draws to a close, there's probably very few people in, the, in Palestine, particularly in Judea and Galilee, who either haven't been personally healed or impacted, or at least had family members or neighbors that did. I mean, Jesus' miracles were widespread. It wasn't an isolated thing here and there. So what is a miracle anyway? Well, a miracle, uh, this is a definition, is the uh, temporary suspension of God's natural law. So when Jesus walks on water, uh, temporarily the law of gravity was suspended. When Jesus makes water into wine, the normal processes of, going, of making wine, you know, planting the vineyards, cultivating the vine, harvesting the grapes, crushing the grapes, letting them ferment. Nah, we don't have time for that. It's instantaneous. Natural processes and laws are set aside. So that's what's going to take place here. And Mary comes to um, Jesus at the wedding, and she makes a request. And um, uh, the mother of Jesus uh, came to Jesus, verse 3, and said, they have no wine. Now, we don't know, there's not enough told to us as to why in the world she comes to Jesus, and what in the world did she expect him to do? He, after all, has not worked any miracles. So what's she expecting? We don't know exactly. However, Jesus' response may uh, indicate something. Jesus said to her, woman, which is not a, a term of disrespect, woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. So, <clears throat> um, he does uh, say, my hour has not yet come. And in John's gospel, a number of times, it will be talking about an event, and it will say his hour had not yet come. And then in John 17, 1, he basically says, Father, the hour has now come. And so it is the time now of, of uh, where Messiah is going to do what Messiah is going to do. And so uh, Mary, though, apparently understood that Jesus could do something that... Um, he had either the wisdom, the power, something that he could probably solve the problem. I doubt that she thought what was, that what was going to happen, and that's what she had in mind. Anyway, you know the story that Jesus has the servants get these water pots, which amounted to about anywhere from 120 to 150 gallons, and had them fill it up, and, and then said ta had them uh, taste it and it was um, excellent wine, and you know everybody's sort of shocked by this who has any knowledge. But this was the beginning of miracles that Jesus did. Now, this raises, though, um, some, some uh, questions. And the first question is basically, why miracles? Now, we need to understand something. There were, well, I'll get to, to that in a moment, as to uh, miracles and their use in the scriptures. 
I think there's fundamentally one primary reason why God had Jesus do miracles and uh, a couple of others as well. Miracles were very, very rare in, in um, human history um, where people do miracles. Uh, some folks out there on TV, you'd think that, that you know, God was doing these by the cartload every day, and that simply is not true. So <clears throat> what is the purpose of miracles? The primary purpose is to authenticate the message and the messenger. Um, <clears throat> when Jesus came along um, into Palestine, uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that at, uh, in the 100 years before Jesus came along, there were about 65 or 70 men who came along making messianic claims. Well, so now you got this carpenter from Nazareth. You know, take number 71, buddy. We got a long line of people claiming to be Messiah. But the miracles were something absolutely and totally unique. And this would catch people's attention and they would mark Jesus out as one sent from God. Later on, and I, I'm planning on getting into John 5 today, which is a very significant chapter, but as Jesus lays out the evidence for the validity of his claims to be Messiah, one of the five ones that he mentions is found in verse 36. But the witness which I have is greater than that of John, for the works which the Father has given me, that is the miracles, the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. In Mark chapter 2 and um, verse 10, um, you have uh, this statement from Jesus. Here he, re he heals a paralytic. This is the guy, remember, who is um, uh, let down through the roof, kind of a familiar story because we, in fact, uh, have it in Sunday school all the time. And um, uh, so he says to him, uh, your sins are forgiven, which of course causes cardiac arrest amongst the religious leaders. Who in the world is this guy? Jesus says this, which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise, take up your pallet, and walk. Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because nobody can tell whether that's true or not. I mean, the guy is lying there paralyzed, and you can tell whether he's paralyzed or not. So Jesus says, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he says to the guy, be healed. So the, the miracles were designed to validate the claims, the message of the Lord Jesus. And then uh, Jesus will give to the apostles only, or just about only the apostles, um, the ability to uh, suspend natural law for healings and the removal of demonic beings and that kind of thing. But this is a very strategic passage because it really impacts our own day. Paul says this, and by the way, there were a lot of people uh, in Paul's day who came along claiming to be apostles, claiming to be sent from God. Uh, how do you know these claims are true? I mean, you can turn on the TV set most any day or night, most any hour of the day, and you've got all kinds of people making claims that God has sent them, God has spoken to them, God has revealed uh, to him this, that, or whatever. Paul says this, the signs of a true or authentic apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs, wonders, and miracles. So you know that a person is an apostle if they can, in fact, work miracles. It's that simple. So, <clears throat> The purpose of miracles is to authenticate the messenger and the message that he is giving. And by the way, with all those, these 70 um, uh, messiahs, 
uh, Jesus immediately stood out as unique and different because he in fact did these miracles. I think there's a couple of other reasons. Um, occasionally, uh, as in the feeding of the 4,000 in Matthew 15, um, Jesus says, I have compassion on the people. They've been with me for days now and have had nothing to eat. And by the way, well, never mind. I was going to say, you think two hours is long. These people were with Jesus all day, but then it occurred to me they were with Jesus. That makes a difference too. <laughs> anyway, you find that he had compassion for the condition that people were in, whether it was a young girl who was uh, demonized or whatever it might be. And <clears throat> the other thing is that the miracles of Jesus were not simply random power displays. They were in fact designed to point to uh, Messiah and the Messianic Kingdom. One of the reasons why, for example, Jesus did all of the exorcisms that he did, were casting out demons by the thousands, is because in the Messianic age, it's a demon-free zone. There are no demons. Satan and his forces are incarcerated in a place known as the abyss. Jesus healed people. Isaiah 35 was clear that the blind will see, the lame will walk. And so Jesus didn't just go around doing power displays, you know, going to the temple and saying, oh, temple, rise up and, and spin around five times and come back down again. He could have done that. Probably lost a few priests who were being slung out. Or go to the Jordan River and say, uh, flow up from the Dead Sea to Galilee. I mean, he could do all those things. But the miracles he chose, as John uses the term, and you can see it in your uh, notes on page 12, Simeon, which is a sign pointer. They, they point to something. They point to Jesus, and they point to his kingdom. And you can go back into uh, Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah, and there time and again, uh, you see what the Messianic age is going to be like. And the miracles were designed to do that. Remember that blind man down at Jericho? Jesus comes through and he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What do you want? I want to be healed. Why did he call Jesus son of David? Because every blind man in Israel had Isaiah 35 memorized. They knew when Messiah came, blind people are going to see. And when Jesus comes along and they understand the messianic claims, they say, you are Messiah, heal me. And Jesus responded to that. So the miracles are not just power displays randomly slung about. They are designed to point to the authenticity of Jesus as Messiah and to give sort of a little picture of what the messianic age is going to be like. So... Miracles um, have very specific purposes, but again, people doing uh, miraculous things is rare in the scriptures. You have the days of Moses, you have the days of Elijah and Elisha, the days of Christ and the apostles, and the only other time is going to be in the tribulation period. But the idea that miracles are happening when people doing the miracles, <clears throat> once the gospel has been authenticated, the miracles um, disappeared. Now this raises a question, of course, what about miracles today? And I've partly answered the question. First of all, <clears throat> let's not get <coughs> in the discussion about can God do miracles? Well, of course he can. That's, that's a non-starter. That's not an issue. The question is, do some of these guys who say they are doing miracles, do they have that ability? I was uh, re looking on uh, YouTube this week at the, the nephew of Benny Hinn, who was very much a part of Benny Hinn's movement. 
He was on the inside. And he said all the years, he has come out of it now, but he said all of the years, with all those claims, he says, I never saw one miracle ever happen there. It's all fraudulent. Uh, and time and time again, these guys are analyzed about what they are actually producing with their healings, much less people coming back from the dead. And the reality is, it is fraudulent. They are not doing miracles. Now, do I believe God can uh, suspend natural law in his own? Yeah, he can. Anne and I would say, I'm an example. When I was 25 years old, uh, I was in Dallas, Texas, and uh, she came home one night and found me um, paralyzed on one side and having seizures on the other. They finally got me to the hospital. The doctors had no clue as to what was going on. In fact, they basically told her, you know, he's done. Put a fork in him, he's cooked. He's all, it's all over. And for three days, I was in a coma. And they did not know what it was. But people were praying. And it turns out that probably what happened um, is that I had encephalitis that had hit the brain. There was another young man my age in Dallas at that same week who died from it. So I am here because I believe God chose to suspend the natural law of this disease and raise me up. I believe he can do that. But nobody healed me in the sense of some guy coming along and putting his hands on me. Those are two very different things. The purpose of miracles was to validate the claims and to validate the message of an individual. And um, that's why Jesus gave to the apostles the ability to work miracles. He will do that in Matthew chapter 10. And he did that because they are going to be the recipients, the channels of God's new revelation. Jesus was very clear about that in John 16 in the Upper Room Discourse. You men are going to be the channels of this revelation. Well, how do you know? How do you know these guys? Well, they had the ability to work miracles, and that's where Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 12 comes in. The signs of an authentic apostle were worked amongst you. Signs, wonders, and miracles. So, um, miracle claims that people make today, you can pretty well be sure that those are fraudulent claims. They are an attempt to establish credibility or some sort of authority. And it uh, is simply not what the New Testament would support. We can talk about this afterwards. We could get off on this. But, every, but just because God does something uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a miracle. I mean, it could be. Um, but we use the word very broadly. You know, uh, some unusual occurrence, we say, that was, boy, God did a great miracle. Um, let's say, for example, that you owe $175 on your electric bill and you don't have any money. They're going to shut your electricity off. So you pray, Lord, I could use $175. Well, the day before they shut off the electricity, in the mail comes a random check from Aunt Susie, who you haven't seen in 30 years, and there's a check in there for $175. Is that a miracle? No, it's not a miracle. Is it a working of God? Yes. The miracle may be that the post office got it there on time, <laughs> but it is not a miracle. God did not suspend natural law. Could he have moved upon Aunt Susie's heart? Yes, he probably did. How did she come up with $175? I have no idea. It is a work of God, but not everything is a miracle. Miracles are, are pretty special. So with that in mind, we want to continue on in the, in the uh, working in the, of the Lord Jesus. Now, <clears throat> in the ministry. In chapter two, and by the way, if you have questions about this, uh, during break time or afterwards this evening, uh, if you disagree, that's, that's fine with me, as I've told you. I've been in the college classroom for 45 years. I've had students disagree with me for 45 years. I'm sort of used to being disagreed with, and if you want to dialogue about it, I would be happy to do so. But in uh, where we have uh, uh, time is not our friend here, we need to uh, keep moving. Okay, now... <clears throat> 
Um, in John chapter 2, after Jesus does the uh, changing of water to wine at Cana of Galilee, um, he goes down to the Passover. This is the first Passover that he keeps now as uh, Messiah. And in verse 13 of John 2, the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And um, he found in the temple those who were selling oxen, sheep, doves, money changers seated. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their temples, uh, tables and said to those who were selling the doves, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews, meaning the Jewish leaders who ran the temple, and by the way, uh, this was in fact run by the godfather of uh, the Judaism at the time, an ex-high priest by the name of Annas. Uh, he appears in John's Gospel in, in the trials of Christ, but he ran this thing and it was a money maker to be sure. He was fabulously wealthy because of the fact they controlled the precinct of the temple and um, he made uh, an awful lot of money. The Jews answered, said to him, verse uh, 18, what sign do you show us seeing that you do these things? It's kind of interesting that uh, the leaders um, do not really question what Jesus is doing. They're questioning who gave you the authority because we happen to be in charge of this place. We run this place. And uh, Jeremiah has a great uh, uh, message in Jeremiah chapter 7 of, um, of the abuse of the temple by the Jews of his day. So <clears throat> um, Jesus mentions his resurrection, which sort of seems out of place at this point, but they will remember it later on. And um, uh, whoops, my little line is too short, I saw that. But uh, one of the things that Jesus is is sort of opening up the door for us to look in is the reality of his resurrection. And we'll say it here and we'll say it on a Super Bowl Sunday as well when we get to the resurrection. The resurrection, the Christian faith stands or falls on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he did not come out of the tomb alive, then as Paul says, this is a lot of nonsense. And you might as well sleep in on Sunday mornings. Um, and all of this is just really empty. So everything depends upon the reality of Christ's resurrection. So by the way, I've told my students over the years, you know, you have doubts sometimes, don't you? I mean, most people do. You're sitting in the quietness of your own whatever backyard or, and thinking, there's seven billion people on this planet how in the world did I get it right and become a follower of Jesus? Well, <clears throat> the point is that the validity of what we believe is based upon one thing and one thing only. That when Jesus died on the cross and was put into that tomb, he came out alive conquering Satan, sin, and death. If he did not, Paul spells out in 1 Corinthians, and that should be 1 Corinthians 15, not 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 15, um, the things that are our are, are realities about uh, our faith um, and what is true if, if he did not come out of the tomb. And therefore, if you have come doubts, then what you need to do, let me tell you what you need to do if you're serious about this. You need to get into a study of the resurrection of Christ even from a historical perspective. There's a lot, a lot that has been written on it. And um, uh, I would suggest that's where you head if you have, in fact, doubts. Okay, now, <clears throat> at this point, what I want to do is to take you on a little tour of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. 
because uh, so much of Christ's ministry is revolves around this temple. Now, what we have here is a model that exists in Jerusalem in the um, area of the Shrine of the Book where they keep the Dead Sea Scrolls and a lot of other things like that. But they have this model, which is a 50 to 1 model scale, which Israeli archaeologists update as they come across uh, new stuff and they, and they can prove it. But for our study, what you have is the, um, is the large temple area, which this would be called the second temple. It is the temple that uh, Herod beautified and expanded. It's actually bigger than the temple that Solomon built. But uh, you can see the, uh, in the middle you have the temple building. And that's where the holy place and the holy of holies was. The large areas on either side are a massive area, the court of the Gentiles. And we are told that on a, um, any given day, you could have as many as 200,000 people uh, in that area. It it's a huge area. So <clears throat> the, the tall building there is the temple proper. And um, uh, Jesus would never have gone into that. Uh, when you read in the Gospels that Jesus was in the temple teaching, it does not mean in the temple proper because he was from what tribe? He's from the tribe of Judah. Who got to go into the temple? Tribe of Levi only. So Jesus never did go into the temple. When it talks about Jesus teaching in the temple, it's in that colonnaded area. We'll look at that in a moment. So <clears throat> uh, this large area was called the court of the Gentiles. It got that title because uh, a Gentile, you didn't need to be Jewish to go into that area. And if you particularly were seeking the Lord Jehovah, God of Israel, you'd be welcome into that area. But um, you can see there's a, uh, well, you can't see it real well, but there's a little, looks like a little line. That's actually a five-foot wall that went all around the temple proper. And a Gentile could not go past that point. Jewish people could. So if you were a Jewish man or a Jewish woman, you could go into what was called the court of women because Jewish women were allowed to go in there as were Jewish men. Um, the treasury was located in here. You remember the story of Jesus watching the widow put her might in. The treasury was located in the court of women. Uh, some of Jesus' sermons like the uh, I am the light of the world was given in the court of women because that's where they had these huge lampstands in there, so it kind of uh, gave a good uh, illustration. Then from the court of women, you would uh, go through this massive uh, bronze gate, <clears throat> up those circular stairs, which was, by the way, a place where the Levitical choirs would sing oftentimes. There were two other courts behind that wall. One of them was the court of Israel, and a Jewish man not a Jewish woman, not a Gentile, a Jewish man could go through those gates and be a, a participating in the animal sacrifice by laying his hands on the animal or bringing the animal to the priest. There's a very clear line uh, of demarcation there. You didn't cross that if you were not a Levite. And so you have the court of Israel, you have the court of the priests, which then in, included the temple area uh, proper. Then <clears throat> you have uh, this, um, this uh, wall area and it was five feet tall. It had, um, I, so in other words it's not like a, on, your, on a curb or something that you trip over it. It's big enough and there's, there were openings in this wall and next to each opening there was a sign and they have actually recovered one of these signs. The sign basically said, if you're a Gentile, you're dead if you go past this point. It was clearly, you don't go past this unless the blood of Abraham is in your veins. So, <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, around the temple were the porticos. 
The one on the east side, which we can't see the colonnaded area, was called Solomon's Porch. And that was a favorite place for the Lord Jesus. Uh, you'll read about it. And the disciples in the book of Acts, they were in Solomon's porch and they would teach because on any given day, if you had gone in there, you would have found Rabbi Ben Eliezer, Rabbi Ben Ali, Rabbi Ben uh, Elihu or whoever, seated all over the place with their disciples, all over the place. I mean, this place is jammed with people, with people teaching in the colonnaded the porch areas. It kept you, the sun off of you, kept the rain off of you. Rarely they had snow, but it kept the snow off if that was the case. So these are porticos that go around it. And the one to the east seemed to be Jesus' favorite. Now, to give you an idea of how big these things, do you see those columns? Those were almost 28 feet tall. There were 350 of them made out of marble. I mean, this was, was one of the marvels of the world. I don't know how tall you are, but think of yourself standing up against one of those things. And you can see that you'd be dwarfed by it, even if you stand 6'5", or something like that. These are about 28 uh, feet tall. As I mentioned, the, the, um, um, the wall, the barrier around the temple uh, was five feet tall. And by the way, you remember in the book of Ephesians where Paul talked about the barrier between Jews and Gentiles are broken down in the body of Christ? I'm sure that this is what he's talking about. There are no restrictions anymore in the body of Christ, the church. Jews and Gentiles are in fact uh, equal. The, um, uh, the um, door into the holy place was about 52 feet high. But the, the veil that was inside the temple between the holy place and the holy, holy of holies was 60 feet high. That's very high. And furthermore, it was cloth upon cloth, so it was actually several inches thick. Now you can understand why the, why the priests were scared spitless that day at the crucifixion when the temple veil was ripped from top to bottom. That's 60 feet up there. This is not like ripping a bed sheet. This is clearly God opening up the Holy of Holies now in the new era that uh, is there. So this is a huge, huge place is this temple. The um, the temple is about, uh, um, is about 1,600 feet long. Uh, the left-hand part of the screen there, 125 feet was added by Herod the Great, extending the platform far beyond what it was in the days of, of Solomon. The southern part <clears throat> of the temple had a double um, porch. And this is called the royal porch. The, we believe that the great Sanhedrin, that is the Jewish Supreme Court, met in here in an area called the Hall of Polished Stone. And so this is going to be one of the places that Jesus will be taken on the night, that, on the morning of his trials. He will then, after being summarily convi convicted, will go 1,600 feet north to Pontius Pilate's place that we'll see in a moment. Now these two places right here, which sort of appear like storage lockers or something, are not that. They're actually stairways coming up from the south. And so this gives a, a little bit different picture of it. And so <clears throat> when you look at the temple, you see those four little doors there those are the stairways that went up into the temple uh, precinct. And um, down at the, the near the, the doors down there, the entrance into the temple from the south, there were, and they're not shown in this picture, but there were these ritual baths, which when we go to Jerusalem today, you can see the steps going down into them. They're all over the place and they were for ritual purification. Before the Jews would go up into the temple, they would ritually purify themselves 
they would go up that stairway. So <clears throat> when we go there, um, that's a tour group from some time ago, but uh, that's one place where you can say, I walked today where Jesus walked. These are, in fact, the first century steps that led up into the uh, temple area. <clears throat> now to the north part of the temple was this Antonia Fortress. This is where the Roman army, the Roman uh, battalions that were stationed in Jerusalem, most of them were up in Caesarea by the sea, but the ones in Jerusalem were stationed here. This is where Pontius Pilate, when he was in town, would hang out. This is where Jesus twice will be taken for his trials. The Romans had agreed with the Jews that the Jews could have uh, the temple area and they could police it and the Romans would stay out of it because the Romans used to do all kinds of crude stuff in the temple, cause riots and so on. But they had to know what was going on so they always viewed what was happening in the temple because if there was trouble that was going to happen, it's going to start in the temple. That historically is where it started. So um, the Fortress Antonia, and today when you go there, it's under the church of whatever, I forget now, uh, you, in, the, in the pavement you see where the Roman soldiers had played games like tic-tac-toe, that type of thing. It was, it's uh, in the uh, pavement there underneath. So, um, one more thing. <clears throat> when um, David uh, took the Jebusite city and made Jerusalem the capital, it was a very small area. That walled area is known as Mount Zion. And the, that building there is David's palace, uh, which is as we speak and has been for the last two years been being excavated by Israeli archaeologists and we're able to, to see that. But Zion was so packed that there was no place to put a temple. David did bring the Ark of the Covenant there and put it in special tents because he sensed that God needed to be near his people and we needed to be near God. The tabernacle was elsewhere. So when David wanted to build a temple, um, God handed that off to his son Solomon, but what he had to do, of course, uh, the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite is up on what is called Mount Moriah. And that's where the temple will now be built. So Solomon built the temple and he built his own house, his own palace there. But of course it had to be protected. So today, when uh, you go to Jerusalem, Mount Zion is south of um, the, um, you go there and you see the walls, the old walls around Jerusalem, you've seen those pictures. That, those were built by the Turks, by the way. And the, the, the architect who built those walls blew it. When, when the guy in charge realized that he had not included Mount Zion, within the walls, they executed the guy, which means your blueprints had better be pretty good. But um, anyway, <clears throat> um, the Kidron Valley, which is visible today, uh, was off to the east. The Tyropian Valley is off to the west, and you can't see that anymore. It's basically been filled in. The uh, Hinnom Valley is still very, very obvious there. So <clears throat> the, the temple was very significant in the days of Christ and the Apostles. The, um, uh, the reconstruction work of Herod the Great was finished in the year 66 AD, just in time for the Roman Wars to destroy the thing in 70 AD. Well, <clears throat> let's get back to Jesus now. Um, the, the money changers would have been in the southern part of the temple area in the court of the Gentiles because most of the pilgrims coming up from the ritual pools would then be able to exchange their money, buy their animals, and so on. So <clears throat> hopefully that helps because um, you know when, when Jesus is teaching in the temple, he, he's basically in the court of the Gentiles in one of the colonnaded areas. And so now he's uh, chasing out the money changers. This will be the first of two times 
when he will do this. His ministry will end doing it as well. Okay, let's uh, move through some of these things kind of quickly. Um, one of the initial results is that many people believed in him. Um, we aren't told what Jesus did, but it says in the text in, in John uh, 2 and verse 23, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing. In John 4.45, a little bit later on, when Jesus ends up back in Galilee, uh, the people there say, hey, do miracles here just like you did down in Jerusalem. Because up to this point, there had only been one miracle in Galilee, that was the water into wine. But the word was out now. This guy works miracles. A lot of miracles are being done. Hey, do some for us here, would you? So Jesus is beginning to do miracles, and people are beginning to look at Jesus for the very first time. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind that the cleansing of the temple, uh, the two main religious sects, the Sadducees, who are primarily the priests, remember these are the political movers and shakers. They're not so interested in theology as they are in raw power. Well, <clears throat> When Jesus now casts out money changers, hey, this is a huge uh, money-making operation for the priests. And when he does that, that obviously alerts the priests. You know, <laughs> uh, we got trouble, Houston. Something's going on here. And when Jesus does miracles, that alerts the, the scribes and the Pharisees to the presence of a religious figure that they need to investigate, which was part of their responsibility, a part of what they in fact did. So, <clears throat> there is no doubt about it that Jesus is now, um, the spotlight is shifting over to him. And the next account in John 3, one of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible, um, we have an individual coming along who is going to declare, um, and let's look at that. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs you do unless God is with him. That man, of course, was Nicodemus. Nicodemus is not some slouch who just blew in off the desert. Nicodemus is a member of the 71 a man supreme court. He is one of the leading rabbis, probably one of the top three rabbis in all of Israel at the time. In fact, Jesus refers to him in verse 10 of John 3, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand what I'm talking about? So Rabbi Nicodemus, and um, when they had viewed his miracles, which he had done in Jerusalem, they rightly concluded exactly what these miracles were designed to do, and that was to authenticate Jesus and authenticate his claims. Now, one of the things, and we will take a break at this point, um, one of the things that Jesus had to deal with and John the Baptist had to deal with was a very sticky point, and that is, the Jews felt that because we are children of Abraham and we are covenant people, that we have a free pass into the Messianic age and the Messianic kingdom. And John and Jesus had the most difficult time convincing them, no, no you don't, that you must believe, you must repent of your sins, believe in me, then you get into the Messianic kingdom, but it's not because you are a Jew. Um, let me at this point, one more thing. Uh, someone asked a question. Uh, let me see if I've got it here. Had to do. It's here somewhere. And what did I do with it? You're supposed to know these things. Well, the gist of the question was... <laughs> 
Um, what about the, the Jews today? You know, are they, um, um, what, what if they don't re and haven't for 2,000 years responded to Jesus? Well, as Peter the Jew said on the, uh, the day after Pentecost or shortly thereafter, there is only one name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. It's the name of Jesus. That's it. Um, when the Philippian jailer asked that question of Rabbi Saul, the Apostle Paul, what must we do to be saved? The answer was very simple. You must believe in Jesus. Period. That's it. And so a Jewish person today who does not respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ is in the same identical situation as a Gentile who doesn't respond to the Lord Jesus. The issues are, are their eternal damnation or their eternal life. Those are the great issues that they face.